Good morning, all, and uh, welcome to the fifth day of the six day workshop on uh, open form. Uh, this is Payal again, welcoming you all today. And today we'll be having the session on magneto hydrodynamics by Professor Abhishek Ranjan of IIT Bombay. So, uh, sir, over to you. You can start the session. Yes. So this is a recorded lecture uh, just for this particular uh, POSI seminar. Uh, it is about 33 minutes. And after that, we I wanted to have sufficient time for question answers. Uh, so in case you have any doubt, I would recommend that you, if you have a pen and paper with you, that's uh, the best. Uh, please make a note of the doubt and uh, uh, maybe it's best to wait till the end and you can mention the uh, slide where you have a doubt uh, or the uh, the context. Uh, so let me start this then. And yeah, and at the end, we'll have the Q&A where I will clarify any questions or any doubts. So, yeah, and after that session, then uh, there's another recorded le lecture uh, uh, in three parts. So there's a three part lecture in, in the part two here, uh, where he will demonstrate how to use the uh, open form software's existing libraries uh, in open form and how to build some new libraries uh, with a different uh, formulation called potential based formulation. Welcome to the lecture on MHD. This is a two part lecture. Uh, and the first part is a brief introduction given by myself, Abhishek from mechanical department, IIT Bombay. And the second part will be given by my student Swapnil, who will talk about how to compute MHD flows using open form. Uh, so a couple of examples to motivate the topic are shown you uh, pictorially on the left hand side. So the top shows the geophysical astrophysical example where uh, you see the sun and the sun's uh, coronal mass ejection CME uh, which hits the earth's magnetic field the solar wind essentially uh, and if the earth's magnetic field was not there uh, that would essentially destroy a lot of communication system that are present so it's uh, of interest uh, to a lot of uh, astrophysicists to understand uh, what is the physics in the solar wind for example uh, that comes into the domain of uh, uh, MHD uh, and the second example is from engineering where I show you the nuclear fusion experimental reactor uh, is called ITER uh, in France uh, where they are trying to do ex fusion experiments and they hope that uh, if it's successful they will be able to produce a lot of power at uh, very cheap cost and hopefully also in a very renewable and clean way. Now this is a brief outline of the topic uh, I will just give a brief overview after which uh, I will talk about the important assumptions and approximations uh, and then I'll talk about induction equation and some non-dimensional numbers and finally I'll mention something called inductionless or potential formulation uh, and that is very important uh, in engineering and some applications and then I will finally end the talk. Now what is MHD? Now MHD is a magneto hydrodynamics but the uh, better term is magneto fluid dynamics uh, because the word hydro uh, essentially means water uh, is uh, the entire community of uh, fluid in including liquids and gases for which MHD is equally applicable. Now, Essentially the basic idea is that uh, there has to be a mutual interaction of a fluid which is conducting in the presence of some applied uh, magnetic field and applied currents. So the fact that the fluid is electrically conducting is very important uh, and also important is the fact that there has to be a magnetic field uh, or electrical current uh, present. Now as you are aware that uh, the major equation in fluid mechanics is called the noise of equation. It's the second law of motion, uh, conservation of momentum. Now there in MHD what we have is uh, body force term is uh, the J cross B by rho uh, which is the essentially the Lorentz force per unit mass term. Now this J and B are variables uh, which may look a bit new to you. So J is called current density and B is called the magnetic field. So these are the two ingredients and essentially the cross product uh, is what leads to some acceleration in the fluid flow or, or retardation depending on the sign. So a non-zero value of the J cross B is an essential requirement. Now you can think about what all can make this J cross B non-zero. So of course uh, non-zero J and non-zero B but also the non-zero cross product. Those three things are required. Now apart from the Navier-Stokes we also need the Maxwell's equations. These equations are essentially shown here. Now in that 
we will make some approximations uh, which will make these equations a little bit simpler and we will see in what uh, framework those applications are essentially valid uh, and after that we will arrive uh, at list of equations which are called MHD equations uh, where you will see a slightly different form of the Maxwell's equations uh, a more simplified version and of course you will see the Navier-Stokes equations uh, once again now we also have the Ohm's law so the Ohm's law is shown here with this uh, equation at the bottom J equals sigma E times E plus uh, U cross B and this E is electric field so electric field is minus of gradient of electric potential so now this equation I said it's Ohm's law uh, but in case you're wondering that Ohm's law that you may know about is V equal to IR uh, it is basically the same equation that now it mentioned in a vector notation now if you write the vector J which is current density as a current divided by area and then you can uh, write the conductivity also in terms of the uh, resistance and the L and the A uh, if you do that you can arrive at V equal to IR so it's basically the same equation there's an extra term present here U cross B that essentially has uh, to do with the fact that the in the electromagnetic induction uh, there is a current which arises in order to oppose the changing ma changing magnetic field it has to do with the Faraday law now I mentioned about the MHD arising because of a mutual uh, interaction of velocity field and magnetic field now what do I mean by that uh, so if this particular type of MHD needs the presence of an applied magnetic field now suppose you think about a moving fluid uh, if there's a moving fluid in the presence of a magnetic field and if they are not parallel uh, that means there will be an EMF which is induced and that results in a, in a current which is sigma times u cross b naught now this induced current which is a, which is a new current uh, arising because of the phenomena uh, conducting fluid moving under the presence of a magnetic field which is not parallel this induced current is linked with a uh, small b which is a magnetic field uh, which basically changes the existing field now it's the total field which now interacts with the current to produce a Lorentz force which is in this case small j cross b and this Lorentz force being a body force term in the momentum equation it affects the motion so it basically changes the velocity field this is shown here in the picture uh, you have a, a, a couple of poles in a magnet and this, this is a conductor uh, which is which if it starts to move towards the right side because of an external force F now what that does is it changes the original magnetic field so you can see a small change in magnetic field arising uh, which is basically there to oppose the motion of the conductor uh, the Faraday's uh, law is what is active here now the Lorentz force which arises uh, is this uh, J cross B this should be a small j here uh, it essentially opposes the F now just imagine that you replace the solid conductor by a liquid metal which is uh, typically very highly conducting uh, there in that case we have the electromagnetic equations along with the fact that the that the fluid and the force acting on the fluid and as you know that fluids are, are deformable uh, which is what makes the topic very uh, complex sometimes and, but also very interesting at the same time now there's, a, there's another avatar of MHD if I can use that word uh, which in this case it doesn't need a fluid to be moving initially uh, if there's a still or a quiescent fluid and you have a large current which is applied then that current with its own magnetic field which can, can create a Lorentz force so that uh, Lorentz force is basically a source term in the momentum equation uh, and that force is sometimes not balanced by the pressure gradient force which is also a term in the momentum equation now whenever it's not balanced this can initiate the fluid flow now this is uh, pictorially shown in the schematic where I have a point current entering from here and the current diverges uh, so it goes in this all these directions radially outward uh, in that in this particular situation it so happens that the pressure gradient is not able to balance the uh, the Lorentz force which happens to be non-conservative in this situation now it is this example which sort of is an example of uh, the situation where the MHD uh, because of a current can also arise 
so now if you have a fluid flow this will have a emf uh, and because of which we'll have a current once again uh, just like we had in the previous slide uh, that current will have its uh, own magnetic field now it so happens that sometimes the uh, induced current small j is very small uh, and it can be ignored uh, so those are some situations which are quite uh, easy to handle comparatively uh, but if it's not the case then the total Lorentz force uh, which is sum of both currents cross product with sum of both magnetic fields must be considered now what is the MSG approximation? So first approximation is uh, the same one that we made in fluid mechanics. We assume that the uh, fluid is a continuum. Uh, we also assume that the charges travel as, at conductor speed, uh, which means we neglect something called Hall effect. We also neglect something called displacement current, uh, which is the dou by dou T of electric field. Uh, in, in case you forgot, this is the, t the current which is uh, essentially there inside a capacitor, uh, which is filled with a dielectric. So in this case, this displacement current is ignored. Uh, we also ignore the electrostatic force or electric force. So uh, if we don't ignore it, become, it becomes electrohydrodynamics. Uh, because this force is ignored, it becomes magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, if you want to get more details about these approximations, you can look at the textbooks. And I have a list of them at the end. Now, with these approximations, the equations become a bit simpler in, in a sense that uh, now you see that the term with electric field derivative uh, in time has vanished. Uh, you don't see any charge density terms. So in that case, those are some simplifications which have arisen. Uh, once again, you see the Ohm's law and the Lorentz force written as uh, J cross B. So J cross B divided by rho is Lorentz force per unit mass. Uh, so but J cross B is uh, nothing but Lorentz force per unit volume. Now let me just give a little bit of a background of what do, you, do I mean by these approximations. They are also called low frequency approximations. Now they call low frequency approximations because if you look at this time derivative, it is 1 over time, uh, which is like a frequency. So if that is ignored, uh, it is like a situation of low frequency approximation. Now one can do a very quick scaling analysis of the various terms present in the Ampere Maxwell's law. Uh, and with that, it's easy to verify uh, in which situations uh, it's possible to make the low frequency approximation. Uh, because if we know that, then uh, we will know where we cannot make this approximation also. Uh, so essentially, I take the uh, Faraday's law and I, I am writing it as uh, electric field by some length scale, uh, which is of the order of frequency times the magnetic field. And if I replace this in this ratio of the two terms that you see at the top, uh, this helps me obtain ratio in terms of uh, the c square which is nothing but light speed uh, and f square is a uh, square of the uh, frequency c square is a square of light speed and d square is a, a square of a length scale now if c is very large uh, which as you know is quite large in uh, most of our applications in that case it is safe uh, to assume uh, similarly if f is small then uh, even then it's safe to assume that the term below is much smaller than the term above and therefore it can be ignored uh, making these equations Ampere's law. Uh, uh, this, sec this term which we have ignored is called Maxwell's correction. Now uh, let us look at how do we obtain the so-called magnetic induction equation or the main governing equation for MHD. Uh, so we start with the Ohm's law and in that we take the curl uh, on both sides. So we have a curl of J and then uh, assuming the sigma to be constant, uh, we have a curl of E and curl of U cross B. In uh, that on the LHS, we use Ampere's law. On the RHS, we use Faraday's law. Uh, replace the terms. And then we use the vector identity with div b equal to 0. And lo and behold, uh, we arrive at this equation where this term lambda is nothing but uh, uh, 1 over mu sigma. And this is also called magnetic diffusivity. Now, this has the same dimensions as kinematic viscosity and thermal diffusivity. So that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, and now you can use some more vector identities uh, and use the fact that the fluid is incompressible. Uh, we can obtain this equation, which is also called the induction equation. Uh, does this equation remind you of a very uh, important equation in fluid mechanics? Uh, you, can, you can pause the video and you can think about it. So I think it's a good time to just uh, pause and uh, uh, get some feedback so that this also becomes interactive. Uh, is there anyone who would like to pitch in and uh, 
uh, answer the question I, I posed here. So the question I posed is this equation that you see uh, in the gray box, uh, does this remind you of any equation that you know? Mm. Now we're just talking equation. You are close, but momentum, uh, equation. momentum equation doesn't have a term which looks like this, right? It doesn't have a term which looks like this. So there's another equation which you can obtain from momentum equation. Anyone? So have people heard about the, the word called vorticity? Does that word mean anything? Vorticity? Yes, sir. Yes. So there's an equation for vorticity, which you can obtain by taking a curl of the momentum equation. And that equation looks exactly like this equation, the equation for magnetic field. Except that uh, uh, the B is now a uh, magnetic field. It was a vorticity in the other equation, vorticity equation. And the lambda is now uh, magnetic diffusivity. Whereas in the vorticity equation, because of uh, the fact that we obtained from momentum equation by taking a curl, we have a new there, kinematic viscosity. So in case you want to learn more about uh, uh, vortex dynamics, what I recommend is that uh, there's a book on fluid mechanics by Kundu and Cohen. And there's a full chapter dedicated to vorticity dynamics. Uh, knowing, uh, learning fluid mechanics without vortex dynamics is kind of incomplete learning in my opinion. Uh, so I, I uh, recommend that uh, uh, like, uh, very strongly to you. Okay, so let us resume then. This. The answer is that it uh, resembles the equation for vorticity. So it resembles the vorticity conservation equation, where instead of lambda, you have the new kinematic viscosity. Uh, and instead of B, you have the uh, vorticity, of course. Uh, but the other terms are uh, exactly the same. And therefore, the interpretation of the various terms is also exactly the same. The first term is local change in magnetic field. Second term is advection of magnetic field because of the flow. Uh, the third term is just like for vorticity, it is a tilting or turning of uh, magnetic field because of the flow or also the stretching of magnetic field lines because of the flow. Uh, the final term is the uh, diffusion of magnetic field uh, because of uh, magnetic diffusion effects. So now let us look at the uh, Ampere Maxwell's equations once again, just to summarize. Uh, so I have already mentioned about Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Uh, I have put the uh, letters in red color here, just to remind you that in this case, Ampere's law has A, which means this equation will have a B here. And here I have a F. So the Faraday's law is going to contain a curl of E. So this is just a mnemonic. It's just useful to remember uh, which law is which. And Ampere's law is the same as the Biot-Savart law. It's just a uh, curl, uh, uncurled. Uh, sometimes it's useful to look at the Biot-Savart law because suppose you have applied current uh, and you want to find the magnetic field because of the applied current. Uh, that is very useful in some applications which are current-driven MSG applications. In that case, the Biot-Savart law is the one which is uh, more important and relevant compared to Ampere's law. And of course, then we have the div B and div J equal to zero. Uh, which is saying that magnetic monopoles do not exist. And the second one is uh, conservation of charge. So current flows in the closed loops. And then we have the same Ohm's law that I mentioned earlier. Uh, induction equation now uh, with the magnetic diffusivity. And then solving this induction equation, which is derived by looking at uh, the uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, the Ampere Maxwell's equations, and Ohm's law, uh, we don't need to solve any of those equations. If you solve the induction equation in our computation, that is generally uh, equivalent. But this equation also is a nonlinear equation. In case uh, you not noticed, there are two terms, u dot grad of b and b dot grad of u. Both could be nonlinear. So it's uh, a complex equation, just like Navier-Stokes. So not always e easy to solve it, uh, especially if you're solving it in conjunction with Navier-Stokes. There are a lot of variables involved. So it is this Lorentz force, which essentially is the term important to initiate flow or accelerate the flow or uh, retard the flow, depending on uh, its sign. Important parameters in MHD. So magnetic Reynolds number is the ratio of the advection of uh, magnetic field divided to diffusion of magnetic field. So that, that comes out to be UL uh, by lambda. So this is one of the most important parameters. And the second most important parameter is also called the Hartmann number. So it's basically the square root of the Lorentz force to the viscous force. Uh, so that is the terms in the in, in the Navier-Stokes equation, which are involved here. Uh, whereas in the first equation, it was the terms in the induction equation, 
which gave me this uh, magnetic Reynolds number ratio and then we can also define interaction parameter which is nothing but the ratio of the Lorentz force to the inertia force. Uh, we also have something called magnetic parameter number since we have a magnetic diffusivity which has the same dimensions uh, the ratio of these two is called magnetic parameter number and we have a couple of parameters uh, called alpine velocity uh, it has a dimension of, of velocity interestingly uh, and then we also have something called magnetic damping time which has the dimensions of time uh, but if you see the ingredients is basically density divided by rho b square uh, which if you apply the right dimensions which you should do and uh, cross verify it gives you the, the uh, time scale of uh, uh, magnetic damping so it's called damping because the Lorentz force is typically a retarding force if you recall the example that I gave in the initially mutual interaction of U and B uh, there the Lorentz force was opposing the moving conductor uh, so typically that is one behavior uh, that is a classic uh, of MHD, especially MHD at uh, low magnetic Reynolds number. So that's why the magnetic damping time the word is used because the magnetic field can damp uh, the uh, velocity field through the Lorentz force. Now what is the inductionless or the potential formulation? Now in applications such as liquid metals uh, and their flows uh, which are not too high speed flows uh, in those applications it so happens that the magnetic field does not change much with time uh, and in those cases the induction equation the full form of the induction equation uh, is not necessarily required so you may only need uh, some parts of it uh, for example the, the diffusion part uh, of the magnetic field will be required uh, the Laplacian of B equal to 0 in, in case you want to find the static field distribution uh, but if that is not required then the entire induction equation is not required to be solved now that is a big advantage because it's one less equation but it's many more variables which are uh, sort of reduced and that lowers your computational complexity so in those cases the equations get decoupled uh, so what I mean is that the Lorentz force that is required in Navier strokes now in classic case where the RM is not low in that case I mentioned that you need a Lorentz force. A Lorentz force uh, requires uh, J and B which are uh, both non-zero and they should not be uh, parallel which requires essentially to uh, compute the Faraday's law and the Ampere's law uh, and Ohm's law. Essentially I'm talking about the induction equation being solved together to, to supply a Lorentz force which is required for Navier Stokes and this gives us velocity field which is further required in this particular part of the uh, Ohm's law which is essentially what gives us the induced current uh, and therefore the this is fully coupled two-way coupled now uh, if equations become decoupled uh, at low RM in that case uh, you you do need a Lorentz force in Navier Stokes equation definitely uh, but that only requires us to use the Ohm's law uh, and in this case the velocity field is certainly required in the Ohm's law which gives us J which gives us Lorentz force but if you look at uh, this coupling compared to the left hand side the Faraday's law and the Ampere's law are not required so that is one simplification which can happen and in that case we only need Ohm's law uh, which you can rewrite with the help of electric field uh, and div j as this Poisson's equation so it is this Poisson's equation which is required to be solved in those situations now it may so happen that sometimes both the current and magnetic field are constant in that case the equations are even more decoupled so in that case uh, we don't even have a requirement uh, to update the current uh, because there's no uh, u cross b or if it's very small uh, that makes the computation much more uh, simple but of course it's only valid in, a, in some uh, specific situations and only for those cases uh, we can uh, make this simplification now some applications of MHD uh, now some engineering applications first now, aluminum production as you are aware that uh, the cost of aluminum uh, got reduced drastically because of the uh, famous hall herald process in which a large amount of current is passed uh, between uh, these two layers so essentially cryolite uh, is the alumina is the aluminum ore and the uh, pure aluminum essentially drops because of uh, being uh, heavier right? uh, and there is a liquid liquid interface here 
Now, any small perturbation in the interface because of whatever reason, such as removing one anode or creating some uh, movement, uh, that means some extra current is, is drawn in some locations and that extra current you can think of it as a small j uh, which will produce some Rodin's force which can make this interface more oscillatory or more un unstable. Now that is not in, uh, ideal because you will want to avoid any short circuit possibility at all cost uh, because that is too dangerous and you will also not want to make this particular layer uh, very thick uh, because it's the layer of lower conductivity so you have a lot of losses happening there so it's a classic optimization problem in that sense and a lot has been done to sort of arrive at uh, some do's and don'ts of what to do to uh, keep the uh, instabilities uh, on the minimal side uh, the other application is uh, continuous casting of steel uh, where the application of magnetic field is required sometimes to uh, retard the flow so sometimes some uh, very high turbulence near the top part can uh, suck some air or gas and it can be uh, like an inclusion which will make the steel uh, quality bad so in that case what we need is a magnetic field to retard the flow uh, and sometimes uh, we need to enhance the uh, motion uh, especially downstream of the continuous casting process sometimes the magnetic field and in this case an alternating magnetic field is, is used to create what is called a, a electromagnetic stirring where if you see in this figure D uh, we have a magnetic field present and the figure A has no magnetic field so this uh, streamline show you the swirl which can be, be uh, which can be created with the help of magnetic field which is called this process is called electromagnetic stirring or EMS uh, the uh, top was called EMBR or electromagnetic braking uh, one of the application is uh, liquid metal battery which is also what we are working on uh, here this, uh, this application is very promising from uh, the energy storage uh, point of view so here we have uh, three layers and uh, all these are liquids uh, there's, a, there's a negative electrode there's an electrolyte in the middle and there's a positive electrode uh, a la the negative electrode is typically a light metal uh, like sodium magnesium uh, lithium uh, and the large current and the current passes here uh, which will ionize this and it will go to the bottom electrode uh, and that will leave some electrons to flow in the outer circuit uh, which we can use uh, to uh, power our uh, uh, devices and the opposite happens when the battery is being charged so in that case the ions go back and join the negative electrode now liquid metal battery is a very interesting concept in a sense that uh, it can be made with uh, potentially very cheap materials uh, it can be made in a very uh, safe and reliable way it can uh, last very long so it's very promising and a lot of work has, has been happening uh, to improve these advantages and to mitigate all the disadvantage of liquid metal battery now as you have noticed that there are two liquid liquid interfaces here so in this case what you see here happening on one interface may happen on both interfaces so it's a classic uh, engineering uh, optimization problem once again uh, apart from this it may also have other phenomena such as thermal convection and the convection because of this concentration gradients uh, which can also arise so this figure shows you this uh, similar schematic that I showed you earlier uh, it shows you the diverging current and converging current in the two different uh, layers because of which the electrovortex flows or the current driven energy flows can arise uh, so going to this uh, geophysical example so uh, we are sitting at the uh, earth surface now around 6500 kilometers below us uh, we have the liquid outer core of the earth and it is hypothesized that the magnetic field that we can measure with our magnets uh, essentially arises in that liquid outer core now exactly how this happens uh, no one really knows because it's difficult or almost impossible to make any measurements so people have done a lot of uh, theory and uh, numerical simulations now it is thought that the flow of liquid iron uh, and in the presence of the earth's rotation and in the presence of the uh, buoyancy because of the thermal gradients and the concentration gradients uh, the combined effect of that is what uh, creates and also sustains the magnetic field uh, against the uh, decay uh, so it has been uh, reproduced very nicely in uh, some classic simulations and in fact uh, the simulations have also shown that magnetic field can potentially reverse so the north can become south and the south can become north 
this happens every 300,000 years. Uh, people say that uh, one reversal is now due, uh, but thankfully this doesn't happen very fast. Uh, and I think it's not a good idea because I think a lot of our devices are actually dependent on the dipolar, the nicely dipolar magnetic field. Now, one question which interests fluid dynamics like me is that uh, how does the, the motion of liquid iron, uh, which is uh, thought to be quite turbulent uh, because the uh, dimensions are very large and the kinematic viscosity of liquid iron is quite small, so it's thought to be highly turbulent. How can that highly turbulent motion lead to a nicely organized dipolar magnetic field? That's a very interesting question which uh, has been has interested uh, researchers for almost 100 years and more. Uh, I showed you this picture earlier where I, uh, this is a Earth, our planet, uh, and its magnetic field. And this magnetic field essentially protects us from the harmful effects of the solar wind. Uh, it's possible to predict the solar wind though. Uh, in fact, we have uh, some measurements also which are coming in uh, as we speak. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe and our own Aditya uh, Solar Mission, they are all uh, gone into this region to take measurements of the magnetic field. Uh, a lot of simulations and uh, theor theoretical work has been done for uh, this particular case also. In fact, the shape of this, uh, what is called as a CME or coronal mass ejection, uh, it was theorized by the scientist called Eugene Parker, uh, in whose name this Parker Solar Probe uh, has been uh, sent uh, by NASA. So this is another image showing you this curved field lines. Uh, I think this is. Uh, may be obtained with the help of some uh, actual data that uh, has been captured. Now, interestingly, a lot of data exists about the sun, but not so much exists about uh, our old planet because of the fact that uh, this is vacuum, so it's possible to make measurements, uh, even though it's not very close, but uh, the mantle and the outer core are quite far, uh, especially the outer core is very, very far. It's very difficult to dig and uh, you know, do any drilling and uh, go to the uh, outer core almost impossible once again. Now let us look at uh, this uh, coronal, the solar flare or this coronal mass ejection, a movie of that and the, this, is, this loop is called the, the, loop, the loop of the solar flare, the loop of the coronal mass ejection. This loop essentially shows you the magnetic field lines which uh, changes quite fast by the way uh, and this uh, artist has also put the earth here as a small uh, circle uh, just to show how small uh, we are compared to a small loop, a small magnetic field line loop on the sun's surface. Uh, so this is the ITER uh, schematic I showed earlier and here there are two ways uh, the magnetic field is involved. So first of all it's involved in confining this plasma which is at a very high temperature. Uh, so magnetic field is used to confine that uh, and the other application of uh, MHD is in the liquid uh, lead lithium blankets, uh, which is a liquid metal at uh, a very high temperature. And that is basically there for three purposes. Uh, it's also there for cooling, so removing a huge amount of heat. Uh, remember that uh, plasma is very, very hot uh, and almost a sun, some kind of temperature. And the magnets, which are almost uh, cryogenic temperatures. So look at the temperature gradients involved here. Uh, so it's so a lot of heat has to be removed. Uh, it also serves the purpose of uh, breeding tritium, which is an important ingredient in nuclear fusion. Uh, and it finally, it also serves as a shielding material for the radiation. So this is being built and um, there's some success uh, recently. I think they are waiting to, uh, they are waiting for the time where uh, they are able to produce more energy compared to the, what the energy that has been put in. Uh, if that happens, then of course uh, from there they will think about some applications and some realistic uh, uh, reactors might be built. This is uh, still an experimental reactor and it's a nice collaboration between several countries. Uh, in case you are interested, you can search about this. Some more applications are mentioned here. Uh, I will not go into the details, but a couple of pictures on the right hand side. So for deep space applications, it's difficult or almost impossible to use the rockets uh, because chemical fuels will uh, of course run out. So in that case, if we have a way of uh, getting some uh, energy from the sun, uh, we can use that and store it in a battery. And if we can use that to uh, propel some electrons from the cathode to the anode, uh, that effect uh, will 
create some sustained propulsion. It will not be a very large force, so we don't need large thrust. What we need is a small thrust for a long sustained duration in deep space. So that is one idea which has been there and uh, I think some MPD thrusters are already built uh, and being used. Uh, the marine propulsion is something which was tried by Japan and even a ship was uh, produced. So as shown you in the bottom, uh, it didn't take off because of the fact mainly that uh, uh, this is to be deployed in the sea. So sea water is conducting certainly, but the conductivity is still much less than liquid metals. Uh, so remember I said that in MHD you need to have the electrically conducting uh, liquids uh, and that is very very important. So uh, low conductivity liquids are not uh, very good candidates for any MHD effects. Uh, so apart from that there is a list of some references and with that I would uh, like to uh, end and if you have any uh, questions uh, I will be very happy. So let me go through this uh, last slide. Yeah. So these are some references. Uh, in case you notice, there are four textbooks that I have mentioned, uh, and uh, uh, the second one is a textbook which is a bit old, so you may not be able to find it somewhere. Uh, but the other three, you may be able to find it. And uh, I don't want to give you ideas on how to find it. I think uh, you know what I mean. Yeah. So any questions, any comments, anything is okay. Uh, you can just feel free to unmute and ask the question. If there are any questions in the chat box, uh, uh, Ms. Payal, would you mind reading that to me? Yes, yes. Uh, we had a question from uh, uh, one person, Shari Huzaman. He was yes. asking, um, sir, do you uh, do any experimental on MHD along with CFD simulation? Yes. So experiments are, are certainly very interesting ways uh, of studying any phenomena. Uh, and we have started doing some experiments. Uh, but not yet with liquid metals. Uh, so we have doing we have been doing some experiments with uh, conducting uh, conducting water. So adding some salt uh, to water makes it conducting. Uh, but you need a very very strong magnet uh, to have any MHD. So I remember I said that you have to have uh, sigma, uh, which is a conductivity, and you have to have the, have the magnetic field. So if the sigma is small, then you have to kind of compensate for that by increasing the magnetic field. Uh, so for that we need strong magnets and strong magnets are not easy to handle. Uh, we have to be very careful in handling. So we have been doing some experiments with strong magnets. Uh, the other option is to use electromagnets. Uh, in case you have heard, heard about Helmholtz coils, uh, some people also do experiments with the help of Hel Helmholtz coils. So we have not done ex ex any experiments with liquid metals as of now, but there is a plan of starting to do some experiments with liquid metals also. Uh, simulations, we have, we have done plenty of simulations uh, for a variety of geometries and uh, both applied magnetic field and applied current simulations we have tried uh, with uh, open foam and with also with uh, some softwares like Comsol and ANSYS. Okay, any more questions, please uh, carry on. Okay. You can unmute yourselves, yes. Uh, give you one example, okay, how to relate the neighbor stock equation with all the criteria. How to relate the neighbor stock equation with? All your criteria, like uh, you give uh, in one slide, the how to connect the uh, um, uh, Ohm's law or some Lorentz law with the navier stokes equation. Yes. So I'm not getting the relate how it is possible. Yes. So the question was about uh, the uh, navier stokes equation, which you see at the top, uh, and uh, it's about Ohm's law. I think it's about in general the uh, electromagnetic equations. So, so if you see the equation, the term that I that I draw a circle on. This is a term which is sort of uh, a new term in the equation because apart from that, this equation is what we already know in uh, the as a vector form of momentum equation, right? Now in this, there are two quantities j and b and j is, uh, is what is called the current density. So it's basically, you can think of the j magnitude is current i by area, okay? Uh, now, B is the magnetic field uh, intensity or also called magnetic field. And for that, we need all of these equations, all of these equations. Uh, so these are all called Maxwell's equations. This, this term Maxwell's equations is actually for whatever you see here. And we also need Ohm's law. So this is Ohm's law. Now, clearly it's a lot of equations that is required to be solved. Uh, and you no, know, that may seem a little bit daunt daunting and intimidating. Uh, that is why 
some people want to derive a compact equation which they call it a induction equation magnetic induction equation which is just a different way of writing all of these equations here so all the maxwell's equations plus ohm's law uh, there was a slide uh, where i showed you what are the different steps involved to obtain the induction equation which which i said looks exactly like the vorticity equation okay so in that case you only need to solve the navier stokes and induction equation that's it so that was the uh, yeah and the other thing i mentioned was that uh, some of these terms for example this term uh, is not required in mhd because of some approximations uh, this term is also not required in mhd uh, similarly here also in the uh, charge conservation yeah this equation is not required to be solved so this this goes away so that's why if you recall i said that you can uh, so the list of mhd equations i mentioned looked a little bit simpler compared to what we saw just now okay so this is a list of mhd equations uh, which are required uh, in a sense uh, either directly or through induction equation which is like a combined form of this uh, all the the top equations so essentially th this entire thing combines to give me induction equation induction equation and this induction equation plus uh, which includes ohm's law induction equation plus this lorentz force as a body force term in the navier stokes is what i require to understand full mhd uh, so in case you don't need to do full mhd uh, for example in some cases all the terms uh, need not be solved so that's called as a low frequency or low rm approximation so in that case the equations does become they become much simpler to deal with so if you want me to elaborate on that i can do that uh, but i hope this answers your questions at least partly yes sir I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, sir, Arpita has one question written in the yes. chat box. I yes. read it for you. Yes. How is the Hall effect ignored, and what are its implications? Yes. So Hall effect is uh, essentially what is called as an E cross B term. So that also leads to an EMF generation. Uh, so in case there's a low frequency approximation involved, which I mentioned here. This low frequency approximation, just like this low frequency approximation, helps me ignore the second part of. Uh, so this Ampere's Maxwell equation has two parts, uh, the top and the bottom, as I mentioned. So from low frequency approximation, we can show that this part in the top is much greater than this part at the bottom. That's what uh, was the purpose of this slide. Now, in the same way, this Hall effect term, which is essentially because of the E cross B. So if electric field and magnetic field are both present and they are not parallel, that leads to an extra uh, EMF generation. And that's what is called as a Hall effect. Now, in the low frequency approximation, we can ignore this E cross B uh, contribution as compared to other contributions like uh, uh, U cross B, induced current and uh, 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 the applied current contributions. So it's just a low frequency approximation, which I, once again helps me. Uh, now, in some cases, it's not possible to ignore that. Sometimes we want to have the Hall effect. And in fact, the current because of Hall effect is the main driving force. In, the, in those cases, uh, we don't ignore Hall effect. But in typical examples of MSD like uh, uh, liquid metal flows, it is common to ignore Hall effect. So there's something called Hall effect thrusters, uh, which is also a device for uh, a space propulsion. So there, the Hall effect is not ignored because you know that is the cause of the uh, the force that is required. So, any questions on applications or non dimensional numbers uh, or potential formulation? So, potential formulation is something which I mentioned. And uh, in case people want to work on some engineering applications of MHD, the potential formulation is something which uh, uh, I think makes the subject also quite easy uh, as compared to the fully coupled uh, situation. Now, is it is it the case that in all engineering applications we can make this assumption? So that is not true. Uh, we can make this assumption of uh, the, the uh, equations becoming decoupled, and uh, you only need Navier-Stokes with Ohm's law. Uh, that assumption is is uh, useful in many applications, but in some engineering applications. So let me tell you one example of an application, like in the continuous casting of steel. Here also uh, the then scales are very very large. So this is what is a liquid steel, and this is an interface. Uh, and there's a magnetic field applied, which uh, essentially dampens the motion of the uh, molten metal coming in and uh, 
uh, this this can become very turbulent uh, at times uh, because of the fact that uh, the velocities are large uh, typically uh, and then the length scales are large and the kinematic viscosity of uh, liquid steel is also quite small uh, so all of that makes the Reynolds number the classic Reynolds number very very large uh, it also makes the magnetic Reynolds number large so there once again we may have to solve the full MHD equations rather than only the low RM form formulation. So that is one example. And of course, when we go to this uh, geophysical and astrophysical examples, uh, like uh, uh, core of the earth, here also the full uh, full equation for MHD, uh, including the buoyancy force, uh, including the Coriolis force because of earth rotation, uh, the entire equation has to be solved. And it has to be solved in uh, a spherical uh, shell uh, geometry. So because the geometry of the outer core is a spherical shell, so that is uh, somewhat complicated, uh, but yes, people, uh, geophysicists uh, do that. Uh, it's quite uh, routine nowadays, but it's uh, very heavy computation. So computations are typically uh, quite computationally like costly. Uh, and similarly, so here also RM, the magnetic Reynolds number is of the order of one uh, or uh, around order of 10. So it's not very small compared to one. Uh, nobody knows exactly what is the uh, magnetic Reynolds number because we don't have an exact idea about uh, what are the typical characteristic length scales and velocities? We, are, we only speculate about them. Uh, on the other hand, we have a pretty good idea about what is happening and uh, at the sun's surface and what are the velocities involved there? Uh, what are the velocities involved in the solar wind, for example? So this is our planet Earth. Uh, and this is like a, a cartoon drawn by some artist. But this, this magnetic field lines are not very far from what is actually there. Uh, so here, again, in solar wind, Maybe at some locations, low RM approximation may work, uh, but typically it is not at all low RM. In fact, very, very high, uh, quite high magnetic Reynolds number. And sun surface, definitely a very high magnetic Reynolds number. So uh, sun surface, the magnetic fields are, uh, field lines are very complicated. In fact, if you see a particular loop, this is basically uh, rising from a North Pole and uh, falling on a South Pole. So on the sun surface, we have many, many uh, pole pairs. It's not a single North Pole and South Pole like we have on the Earth. Uh, it is quite complex and uh, multipolar. In fact, if, you, if there are inter interests uh, among people, you can look at the theory of sunspots. So there's something called sunspots. And every 11 years, uh, there's a certain pattern which repeats in the sunspots. Uh, and you, one can predict uh, what is going to be the sun's surface uh, in, in uh, ahead of uh, time also because of simulations and because of uh, this uh, knowledge that we have gained uh, about the activity on the sun. If you have any questions or comments, anything, you can just feel free to ask. Uh, so the thing is, when we talk about validation in any flu or anything while doing CFT, yes, how do we know what we are doing in this MHD is right or wrong? How do we validate whatever yes. what we are doing? Yes, yeah, so we so we cannot validate with any experiments. For example, with uh, for the Earth's uh, no, not about the Earth, but normal yes, uh, yes. simple uh, like electrolyte and everything. That yes, yes. About. yes. So there are some experimental uh, data that is available. Uh, not all in realistic geometries. Uh, so I think for each of the applications, uh, including and I think we accept liquid metal batteries. For each of the applications, people have done some simplified experiments. For example, for with this aluminum production, people have taken uh, two different liquid layers. And, uh, you, and you, since you know about non-dimensional numbers, you can design your experimental setup such that the dynamics which you see in your model uh, is also what you may expect to see in the actual scenario, right? So in that case, uh, uh, lab experiments are definitely possible. And there is some data, but data is very scarce. Uh, the reason is that uh, in classical fluid mechanics, uh, because you use air and water most often uh, as your experimental fluids, uh, yeah. you can make a lot of uh, intrusive measurements with the help of uh, your PIV and other stuff. Now here, the typically all the conducting liquids, uh, like liquid metals, are opaque. That means it's very, very difficult to make any, almost impossible to make any measurement with PIV because optics doesn't work in opaque uh, liquids. Uh, we can use something called UDV, ultrasonic Doppler velocimeter. Uh, we have that in our department here, and we have been using it uh, not for liquid metals yet, 
but we plan to use that. But the di difficult thing about that is it only gives you the uh, velocity at on a particular line. So it works like uh, the LDV, laser Doppler velocity meter, in the same way. But here it uses the sound waves. Now sound waves can travel uh, in the opaque liquids also. Uh, yeah. But and so they, they travel, they reflect back, and the uh, shift in the velocity, the phase shift, is what is recorded and converted to velocity. But the limitation is it only gives us uh, the velocity on a particular uh, in a particular line. So we need a lot of uh, Doppler uh, UDV uh, velocity meters to get a like a full picture, which is where simulations are a very very big help. Uh, so yeah so but there is there is some data but very very scarce data in fact we also struggled uh, with uh, finding data to uh, validate our open form simulations so it's it's a major issue and then what about the liquid metal batteries we were talking about something about that so liquid metal batteries there is no measurement available on the like uh, exactly for the battery configuration but there are some measurements available for example let us say if we take one top this top gray part this is one electrode uh, so current entering from a smaller area to a larger area. So there are some experiments which have been performed in this configuration where uh, people have studied electro, electro vortex flows uh, and people have also studied some other phenomena. Uh, again, with the help of UDV and some similar devices. Uh, so we have some line measurements uh, available and reported literature. Some are from the early, uh, I think around 80s, early 90s. Uh, and uh, th th those are what we used for validation. Some recent experiments also done in China uh, and in Germany. So Germany, there's a group in Dresden. It's called HZDR, Helmos Zentrum Institute in Dresden. They are the one of the world's leading group in uh, uh, the entire MHD. Uh, so in fact, they have worked on almost all aspects of MHD. So they have a very good facility also for uh, making uh, uh, some fantastic measurements. So if you're interested in what kind of experiments they do, they do you can look at their website. In fact, they also create a mini dynamo, like a small uh, spherical shell kind of. A, I think that is also there in America, uh, in Johns Hopkins or Maryland. I think Maryland. Uh, but yeah, so difficult, ex difficult to experiment. But uh, people have tried. Also very expensive and uh, I mean very very uh, difficult to get funds to get do experiments for fundamental stuff. But yes, liquid metal batteries. I think we need more experiments and uh, hopefully I think with time. We'll we'll get some more data. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, seems to be no more questions. So, right in that case, I will stop sharing, and maybe Sapnil can start sharing his screen, and then. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir.